Happy Friday, everyone. Nathan Happy just, Friday. Nathan welcome. just went to turn the lights off. <laughs> yeah, welcome back to Naoto's Nerdy Power Hour. Yes. Um, for those of you who uh, who watched, well, I don't think no one's watching right now. I've got a few folks tuning in. Okay. okay. I can't see the, how many people are watching. But the uh, it was very, very fun last night when the... Uh, when we get to finally um, interview a uh, massage san live yeah, that was awesome. I, it was fantastic. I, I had a such blast. It was great, um, great time. We we could have gone longer, <laughs> yeah. but the, but, that was the beginning of his day as well, right? So I felt bad because we were probably uh, probably taking up the most important part of his day. But it was nice. It was yeah. nice to. Have- uh, nice of him to hang out for so long and answer so many questions and uh, and I, it was just great. I mean, he's such a nice guy and he has such intelligent answers to the questions. It uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was great. So yeah, for those of you who hadn't watched, haven't watched uh, the uh, there's uploaded version on our channel on YouTube. So uh, go and watch it. It is kind of long video, but I I well. If you understand Japanese, skip everything what I said in English because it's it, it's gonna shorten this so so uh, so good. Yeah, Show and if you don't understand Japanese, just do it the other way around. Just skip the Japanese parts and just listen to the well, English. You know, the charm is though, like when he's speaking in Japanese, yeah. that's the charm. So yeah, yeah, it's, have- it's 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 cool to hear him talk, and uh, I mean, it's yeah. clear that he's excited about what he's talking about, and he's having fun talking about it. We should uh, we should actually I, I should actually work on the uh, putting the subtitles in. Yeah, yeah, you can do that on YouTube pretty easily. Yeah, a little bit more uh, proper one so that the we could just cut, you know, all that the uh, mm-hmm. all that the bogus thing that I said, you know. <laughs> right. No, you did a great job, Nato. Yeah. And thanks everyone that tuned in yesterday and asked such awesome questions. Um, obviously, we didn't get to answer every single question, but uh, you know we. Tried, tried to get to the most popular ones and uh, and kind of be be fair about it. Um, so yeah, thanks thanks everyone that tuned in. And if you if you missed it last night, uh, don't worry, it's up. It'll be up forever, so you can go back and watch it this weekend or something. Uh, lots of folks tuning in saying hi. So thanks for joining us on Friday, everyone. Uh, Ray says the weekend starts now. This is this is when my weekend starts. Is when we start the power hour. Yeah. <laughs> Do you get some? I'm in the same boat. Yeah. Um, so uh, what are we talking about today, Nato? Well, today the uh, I think kind of goes back to basic, but we we wanted to um, do a step by step, like a little bit more nice. Uh, we are going to talk about the uh, thinning of the knife, which we continuously talk about, right? The uh, mm-hmm. how important thin knives are. Uh, I want to kind of uh, put the uh, little bit of perspective of what of what the massage son said yesterday about the multi-purpose knife, which was basically the um, you know. It, in order for the knife, I'm going to sharpen today at Santoku. In order for the Santoku to be a, a fully multi-purpose um, whole edge, the bevel angle, you may want to change it. And I will incorporate um, what he says into today's uh, sharpening. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, because he's, I mean, he, he thinks of, well, and you too both think about sharpening in more, I think, dimensions than the average person. Um Sorry, car alarm. Uh, thinking about, uh, you know, not just getting the, the bevel thin and like a nice taper and all that kind of thing, but considering different thinnesses at different parts of the blade. And, you know, they, there's way more kind of uh, technical thinking that goes into it. So I'm mm-hmm. excited to see how what you do today. Yeah. So, yeah, the um, again, for everyone, you know, who's watching, um, like and subscribe, probably if who's, you know, watching right now. Do already have su- subscribed to our channel, but we try to put the uh, new cool stuff. I like every week. I have been um, thinking. Well, we'll definitely have the uh, Mar- interview with Maruyama San, uh, mm-hmm. next month, who is the uh, sharpener of the uh, this um, former no- known as a old Sakai, but now they've uh, rebranded themselves into uh, called, uh, the brand called Hado. H D, yeah. which we are going to get the a uh, little bit more knives from Hado pretty soon. But we would like to, um, I would like to interview him. But when we are talking, uh, how we are going to go about, they were like, 
it may be a little bit easier to do it, everything in Japanese first, mm. then I get the subtitles. Um, that's definitely the plan. Uh, yeah. And the um, I have not finalized yet, but here is my plan. There are a lot of blacksmiths who is not particularly in living in the region or working in the region where a lot of blacksmiths um, work or live. For example, mm. Take for Night Village. It is a huge facility. And if, you know, once you enter, once you uh, start apprenticing in that particular uh, facility or city, you get to see lots of different um, knife makers, right? You right. learn from them and everything, and you can communicate and you uh, you grow together type of stuff. But right. at the same time, there are a lot of blacksmiths and even the younger ones, there are a lot that basically doing by himself in right. the city where he or she or mostly he may be the only blacksmith in that region, hundred like you know, fifty kilometers. No in kidding. Right. So yeah, because well, a lot of the blacksmiths we know they live in like really concentrated areas where it's like, and that's how it was traditionally, right? It's like this is where they make the steel, so this is where the blacksmiths are, and there's yeah. dozens of them, right? Oh so, yeah. So, but you know, we've start to uh, you know uh, getting com getting touch and com getting communicated with the uh, those people like Monaka san like Miyazaki san, and and those those people, those guys are relatively young. They are in our generation. Monaka san is the same age as me, 37, 38 years old. Mm. Miyazaki san is 35. Mm, and uh, right. uh, Tsuyoshi Yoshizawa san from Nigara Hamono up in uh, Aomori Prefecture, he's 35 or 6. But I've seen his incredible work uh, from him. So here's my plan. Haven't finalized yet, but I would like to do a this recorded version of me um, facilitate facilitator as as a facilitator ask questions for each guys and yep. have have three guys on the same screen yeah gotcha and ask same questions yeah I would ask them to have some sort of like you know big piece of paper write yep. the answer and you know show it to the I've been thinking of it so cool I'm excited if yeah happens awesome. i'm excited from my perspective but i'm excited so that the those uh relatively younger up-and-coming blacksmith uh can communicate can uh, have a little bit more uh connection right yeah they can get to know each other a little exactly. bit maybe yeah 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 that'd be really cool because that's i mean people are pretty lucky these days that they can communicate by the internet but i i don't know if there's really like a, a online blacksmithing community like that mm -hmm. so that's that's really right. cool I would like to. Uh, I'll start talking. I talked to Monaka-san, and it seems like he's into it. He was very appreciative, and if yeah. that happens, it would be great. So I will talk to cool. the other guys too, uh, um, <clears throat> and hopefully uh, that will happen before the um, before the you know we try to feature those small makers, those small makers yeah. month. This, uh, yeah. So for those of you that that don't know, uh, last year we started something called Small Makers Month because we're you know being a larger knife store as far as Japanese kitchen knife retailers go. Um, we <laughs> we need to buy from people like Masashi-san who can make a lot of knives and supply, I guess, our demands. And uh, there's a lot of blacksmiths that we'd like to carry that we just can't carry as full time lines. So Small Makers Month allows us to really not only bring in some of the some more of those knives but spend a month shining the light on them giving them the attention they really deserve on social media on our website in store and and through our youtube as well so i'm i'm excited for it it's this will be the second one ever and it sounds like it's going to be even better than last year well yeah because you know second time always is uh, yeah. yeah yeah but blank blank saying they should start a, a blacksmith discord <laughs> uh, which i think is a great idea now so you should i don't if they don't know about discord you should introduce them because it's a it's a cool little chat space that they can invite other blacksmiths to and they could mm. you know have discussions I'll, i right. i don't know have you checked out the knife War discord yet i haven't i haven't i didn't have time yet well I'll, I'll be i'll be down at the warehouse next week so we'll we'll yeah. go through it together but it's uh it's cool because it's it's sort of like almost a bit like an old school internet chat room but right. uh it's it's a little bit somewhere between that and like whatsapp so it's easy mm. way for people to connect with each other 
But if anybody's watching and they haven't joined the Night for Discord yet, um, we started it about a month ago, primarily because Blank Blank and a few others um, were were demanding it, uh, and I was doing a, an awful job making it happen. So we finally, uh, finally, finally started a Night for Discord. The link is down at the bottom of the description. And uh, it's just a great place to have conversations. Uh, we talk about knife sharpening and knives, obviously. Um, some folks ask questions if, if maybe there's something they're trying to figure out. Uh, but we also just post pictures of food and uh, our cats and whatever else comes to mind. So it's, right. it's a fun kind of community space. So if yeah. you haven't joined, we'd love to see you there. Awesome. Well, yeah, yeah. Look, Looking forward to actually get in, get in there. All righty. Mm. So what I'm going to do today is the, uh, you know, sharpening a uh, this koishi santoku today um the problem of this uh, koishi was uh, returned from the customer um twice the first time it, it got back i the chip was very weird so i took picture and uh, they get the good opinion from the blacksmith um they said a little bit of carbide the concentration of carbide flaked off so that once you sharpen it up it should be fine uh, but the um, so I sh sharpen it up and send it back, but apparently it happened again. Mm. Uh, very similar chips, so yeah. we you know took it. So see what we can do about it. So fairly sharp. It's got tiny chips yeah. along the uh, along the tip here. Here I'll uh... enable the enable the camera right there. Yeah, right here on the tip. Yeah. Yep. Now, this is important to know because Japanese knives can chip and uh, it happens often from, from mishandling. But um, if a chip looks a little funny, sometimes we monitor it and keep an eye on it because it could, it might not be user error. Sometimes there is an issue with the steel. It's rare, but it, it happens. So it can happen. So we, when that happens, we take it and we, this is basically, we replace it with that brand new one. Yeah. It's it's rare that we do that because it's rarely the knife. Yeah. But, uh, when it is, it's when, uh, it, when it happens. Yeah. We 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 got you covered, and then we and, and then the knife uh, comes to Nauta's Nerd Hour to be experimented upon. Yeah. So here, um, I will, I'm going to start from the uh, this uh, 220 knife or 220 stone, and just remove this uh, whole chip out. When I remove the chips, uh, for those of you who've watched before, I do it pretty high angle. This camera angle today is pretty good because you can tell the uh, the angle I'm sharpening at. Um, generally speaking, when I'm putting the final edge on, this is about the angle I'm I'm actually holding knife at. Yeah. About 15 probably. But the uh, when I'm sharpening or taking the chip off, off I put a pretty big angle. It's faster. It's quicker to remove, right? Mm, yeah, right. So, just before we got started, uh, Mark Laporte on Facebook had a good question. Um, was just wondering what stones will you use and why? So I figured we could talk about each stone as we get to it. But but uh, so this is the knife for two twenty. Why are you using that stone in particular? Well, 220 stone is really coarse. It's fast grinding stone. So the uh, purpose of this stage, where I'm doing right, what, what I'm doing right now, is really to remove the chip fast. Right. So. This stone is great. I just threw it today, and. Um, I may actually chew it with the something that's a little bit more coarse, uh, coarser. I, mm -hmm. I did it. With, I did it with the uh, fairly fine uh, diamond stone. So what yeah. happens with diamond stone is that the uh, um, it kind of doesn't have as much grab as I I like this stone to have. Yeah, it like makes that move too, or makes that stone like too smooth, right? Yeah. Yeah, I find like I love the diamond and stones, but it, they're kind of funny sometimes when you true stones with them. It's great for some like fine stones. Yeah, 
I find like if I use it to flatten out the green wheel, it can yeah, be, yeah. it almost feels like it's not really grinding. Blank Blank says, uh, says they find loose silicone carbides. Uh, so loose silicone carbide works great for coarser stones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, to give it a nice coarse surface. That makes sense. The um, Often I may even actually uh, make a little grooves. <laughs> right, yeah. And what, what would you use if you were going to do that? Um, I use the... Uh, Something that's harder stones, like we don't have that many, but the, uh, uh, like this guy here. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's really hard stones. So I may just do that. Cool. Okay. The, some of the keys when you're uh, grinding the tip or grinding the chip out, definitely you want to retain the um, profile. Yeah, so that was going to be, I was going to ask that. Are you removing an equal amount of steel at each part of the edge? That's what I'm, what I'm trying to do. Right. So besides this stone being really coarse, why would you potentially use this one over some of the other really coarse stones that you use sometimes? This here, this uh, Nifer 220 stone is fantastic. It is um, slightly, compared to some stones that we used to carry, it's called, like Aratokun from Imanishi-san, um, this one is a bit harder than Aratokun. So it oh. retains that flatness a bit longer. Yeah. Grain, it seems, though, it's slightly uh, smaller. So um, it doesn't do fast job, but the uh, it leaves the a little bit more evener um, finish on the uh, bevel so it's pretty we right. really like this stone that's why we got the this as a knifeware stone okay cool yeah so you don't get any like deep gouges in mm -hmm. the exactly and it doesn't yeah. wear dish as fast right yeah okay that makes sense so once removed in the chip then it's a first step for the thinning Thinning is important for those of you who don't, you know, like tune in every week. Uh, thinning is basically to sharpen this, especially this particular knife here. You see that the little line right here and anything below that is the bevel, right? And the thinning is really to sharpen this whole bevel, make the whole bevel thinner back again. Um, What's important is that the, when you're trying to cut the root vegetables, potato, yams, carrots, anything like that, this thickness or this thinness is the essential part of uh, you know how easy it is to cut into those root vegetables. Right. Yeah. How smoothly it goes through exactly. uh, without getting stuck. And even if it's like the ed the last edge is tiny bit dull. As as long as the bevel is really thin, it works fantastic as well. Mm. Right, so this one here, uh, we're gonna be super um, koishi here. It's got a little bit of a tiny bit of chip along the along the up by the tip here, so I removed it. First thing, when you uh, before you start doing all the heavy lifting work, like you know thinning, uh, you want to make sure this knife is the uh, good condition uh, to be thin. What that means is that the uh, in order to thin, in order to uh, sharpen them evenly all the way across, I always, I always like, I try to always talk about this stone here, which it's kind of hard to um, uh, keep in stock right now because of not only just the demand, it's just really the EMS services or the pandemic. Um, yeah, it's a little trying bit to, trying to get something onto a boat is damn near yeah. impossible right now. <laughs> The especially small amount with the uh, pool services, yeah. but this stone here um, called Kensho uh, Itadaki 3000, really really hard white stone. White is actually very important. Um, this is the uh, it's a checking your checking your con knife condition of your knife stone. That's what I okay. Say. So the so, the color of the stone is is more important than one would think. Yeah, and color. That as gives the uh, this knife here. So what I'm going to do is to test if the, this knife is straight. 
I'm sure this right. will be nice. So what I'm going to do is that I'll put that the uh, knife, uh, put the bevel flat on the stone here. Then I'll do a few strokes. So this, this stone, I mean, we've seen this before. The stone acts as your baseline test. Yeah. So here. And, and so you can check multiple ways as well. Okay, yeah. So you see the uh, little, um, it's kind of hard to see. Today we don't have that, the you know, fancy sunny today. <laughs> so I have to stop quite quite a bit to get, get this focused. But the uh, what you can see is where the stone has touched and where it has not. And you may be able to see here, this portion here is not touched. And so it's some parts. And if you do it on the both sides, and if the knife is not straight, you see, oh, this is great. So on this especially side here, you see this section, whole section is actually untouched. Yeah, no kidding. Along the edge here. So how I do, and so when I actually check the strainness, I see the blade has been tiny bent to it. No kidding. So there. So, so Annabelle's got a really good question because mm -hmm. I know you really like this particular stone, but it says, yo, can you do the same test with Nanawa 8000 Snow White? Uh, or does it need to be a lower grit or harder than that? The uh, does this is three thousand. Doesn't have to be a um, eight thousand. Probably make sure you make first couple of strokes is always the key. So make sure you uh, you make the stone super super flat. You could even do it with the um, some um, what you call that uh, uh, this white these white stones from uh, from Shapton as well. Okay, cool. I'm trying to so there's a variety of stones you can use, but you want something relatively hard and you want something white. Yeah. Okay. How, how often is the color of the stone? Like, it, it seems like there's certain colors that are common for, for certain grits, but it, it, how often is the color of the stone really, uh, like, practical like this? How often? Yeah. Like, like how, how often does the manufacturer give the stone a color that's really uh, functional? Because obviously the white color on this stone, yeah, there's yeah. a real reason behind it. Are any of the, like some stones are green or purple or whatever, orange. Those, those don't, don't have the, uh, those don't have any, any particular reason, except it's easier to identify. Okay. Like if you look at the color, you see, oh, that's, that's pink. So that's, that should be 3000 and stuff like that. Uh, sometimes say white, um, the Naniwa 8000 or Naipur 8000 is very similar stone. Uh, these guys uh, use the white Almina powder as a uh, abrasive. Okay. They do definitely add a little bit of color white, but yep. the, uh, hmm. but this particular stone here uh, developed by the uh, Masashi Fujiwara-san. Uh, he specifically asked them to make it white. So, like, it's like you see, a 1,000, yeah. 3,000, 6,000 are all white. Right. Well, and he's a he's a really talented sharpener. So I feel like if he's got a request like that, it's not for a not for an arbitrary reason. No, it's alrighty. So check this flatness here, the straightness. And if you need to learn how to straighten your knife, you should check out the YouTube video on our channel made by Nauto, all about how to straighten your, your uh, Japanese kitchen knife. Yeah, Speaking yeah. of which, we have a new video this week. Uh, I, I would imagine most of the folks watching have probably seen it, but if you haven't, go watch it after this. It's all about uh, why you should keep your stones flat, why you should true your stones, and how to true your stones, and uh, different uh, tools you can use to do so. So while you're flattening that guy now, so I've got a question from a few minutes ago from TJ Ronan, who always has good questions. Says, uh, 
Uh, Yan Sharpening a Yanagiba, any tips on how to get my mirror polish back after they sharpened it? Um, a few ways. The uh, to get the real, real mirror polish by using the stone. Just the stone is hard. If it's not impossible, but it's very hard uh, because the uh, you know hardness of stone, especially um, when you're making a stone flat. Um, it often touches only like portion of it, not whole thing. And in order to get really nice mirror, you are um, you try to make the those um, parts. I guess the you you want to make it as as smooth, right? Right, uh, as consistent as possible. Yeah, making it with the uh, sharpening stones could be pretty hard. So a um, few ways the. Uh, to be quite honest, the uh, knife makers, the polishers or sharpeners, what they use is the uh, you know butting wheel, right? The uh, I I this did the um, this uh, famous sharpener uh, Tosasan in the Sakai, and mm. he used he we when we used to carry the mirror knives from the Honosuke, that's the yeah. guy who was doing that, right? Yeah. That he was like he was basically using all the uh, buffing wheels with chromium oxide and mm. uh, oxide and stuff like that. Wow, uh, I'm kidding. What you could do, and I've seen it then at like home level, is that the just have the uh, multiple sandpapers, different grit, yeah, yeah. and the diamond paste. So it just really needs lots of patience yeah. to uh, do that. That's why. One of the um, we do have one of the Honyaki knives that has a mirror polish, mm -hmm. but the um, the bevel part is not po mirror polished. The uh, oh, flat part is, but yeah, the, yeah. the bevel part is not because right because you're uh, gonna resharpen it, it's gonna get yeah. gonna change anyways. Yeah, obviously you're you're sharpening it right, so yeah. Yeah, and TJ, if you haven't already, I don't think you have, but uh, if you're interested, uh, come join our Discord. There's a link in the description, and I know several of the people there would be happy to help you further. Um, uh, probably Blank Blank. Uh, I know uh, Blank Blank was talking with someone about uh, mirror polishing just this morning, and uh, also, or maybe last night, and uh, James Wang, I know, has done a lot of that as well. I might be able to get yeah, yeah. his advice. <laughs> We don't, some have, really... don't, don't have enough time. <laughs> yeah, I don't have I don't have enough time in a year to do do what James does. It's really impressive <laughs> stuff. So uh, um, yeah, go for it. Sorry. Uh, well, blank blank just said uh, I used to watch a YouTuber uh, YouTube videos with a Seki sharpener who always used those wheels. Uh, mm -hmm. Can't remember can't remember the name. Do you do you happen to know? Because you watch some sharpener. Japanese. Seki Sharpen. I, I watched the YouTube from Yamawaki Hamono. He's from Seki. Uh, he okay. he doesn't do much uh, polishing. Seki, I follow a few people. Um, but Seki is a little bit more um, machine sharpening um, yes. center. Like the, the Seki is placed for the uh, machine. Um, mm. I don't want to call it machine made knives. Cause right. Machine are not making knives the uh you know people are yeah but, machine know, machine forged but handmade yeah, yeah exactly yeah yeah maybe um, sakai it, one blank. Or, yeah. yeah or maybe sakai it might have it's been probably sakai, the uh, guy uh hatsuke or uh, the uh, yeah the uh, shimizu san from uh, yamaki hamano he has the uh, pretty good um mm, cool right on but yeah the uh all right so here uh, I've started the uh, next uh, next process. So after I checked it, I checked the condition of the knife, re removed the chips, condition the knife, uh, made sure this knife is straight, uh, and I also made sure the stone is flat. Uh, I started sharpening by putting the bevel down pretty flat. Uh, this is the simplest way to make your knife thin. Uh, there are multiple ways that I actually do a little bit. So um, okay, if you actually do uh, here, it's actually pretty good. Um, as the Masasa was mentioning, m multifunctional knife should have like should be sharpened slightly different on the section by section, and I totally agree. Right, because you're doing different jobs with different slightly, parts right? 
and I would like to have the heel a little bit stronger or the, the tip much thinner. So what I would do on this guy, and I'll show you how tonight, is that the uh, – and this camera angle is great, right? It's not the hot, like greatest resolution right now, but you can see a little bit. So when I'm sharpening the tip here, this is the angle. You see there's like literally nothing there. Yeah. When I'm sharpening at the heel, you see kind of it, it gave a little bit more space. Yeah, going up a couple of degrees. Yeah, yeah, a couple of degrees. Here, here. Hmm. Here. And regular sharpening angle is like this. So it's much lower than the regular sharpening angle, but it's different. See? Yeah. So when I'm sharpening the heel, I give tiny bit of angle like this. And is that just pressing on the edge, or are you actually lifting a little bit with your right hand when you're doing the heel? Uh, heel, I do lift a tiny bit by putting my okay, yeah. in the thumb as well. Yeah. And put my index finger closer to the edge. So this little bit of angle here. And when I'm sharpening at the tip, I I put the uh, the fingers a little bit more closer to the uh, bevel line, which is called shinogi line, like this line here. Okay, okay, cool. So I get to actually, uh, there are friend of mine, the, uh, he used to be a, a chef for the uh, uh, Consulate General of uh, Japan in Calgary. Oh, and, uh, Ken, Ken-san, right? Yeah, Ken-san. He, yeah. uh, he had a little bit of struggle of sharp. He is such a great cook. His knives yeah. are all sharp and stuff, but he kind of asked me for a tiny bit of uh, help or the tips for the sharpening. Yeah. And I told him about this and, you know, like, Heel, tiny bit, tip, yeah. you know, and explain why. Because you know, tip, cool. you're, you may be using a tip just for doing this, you know, onion mm -hmm. cutting. You're cutting this way. You want to have that little bit more peeling action at the heel. So yeah, uh, right. Cool. Did he did he go back to Japan? Is he not yeah, working for the Consul General anymore? He did. Oh. He did. But. Um, when I when I was actually showing him doing this, because you know I I sharpen quite a bit of knives and you know I can do it while I'm talking and I can just do as I can slide my finger. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, yeah. Well, because it's it's all muscle memory for you at this point. Yeah. There's no you know you're not exactly paying it like you're paying attention, but you're not. Yeah, and he's like, whoa, that that transition is so smooth. I'm like, yeah. I'm gonna feel yeah. That. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty slick to watch. <laughs> I I went to Sait when I went to culinary school with a uh, a Japanese fellow who had moved a, a few years prior, but he was born and raised in Japan and spent some time in Japanese restaurants. Mm -hmm. And we all, well, everybody pretty much got a set of Victory Knox knives uh, for for school, and he had taken his Victory Knox ten inch chef's knife. And he had sharpened, uh, he had turned it into a single bevel. He had sort of, oh. he had sharpened like a really wide bevel all along one side. Right. And, uh, and he was polishing it on like the 6,000 Arashiyama that I have. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, he did a really good job. But I, I was like, what did you do to this knife? It's really cool and weird looking. He had to sharpen it like pretty much every day because it was such yeah. soft steel. But something that you have to remember though, the um, not all the chefs knows, like in, even in Japan. Even if not, not all the chefs are great at sharpening, they do know for you know basics, but the uh, not as nerdy level as the uh, sharpeners do, right? Yeah, yeah. So something that you gotta be a little bit more careful. Um, it's a little bit of secret 
Um, but the when I visited um, this knife company in Japan, they had a knife from this very very famous sushi chef for maintenance. Mm. Very famous. If you watch, if you are, if you're paying attention, if you're interested in Japanese food sushi on an Instagram, you definitely see. Him. <laughs> And uh, his knife was on the maintenance, and you know it was it's mirror polished knife, right? And he yeah. sharpens them to put the edge on, and yeah. I, <laughs> I I get to actually look at it. I look at it, like look at it the bevels, and and told him, you know, he's he's okay with the sharpening. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he he's he's um he's not a sharpener, right? So I don't yeah. expect to be that yeah. great. So and you know. But yeah, that's funny. Yeah, uh, I, can't, okay. I can't really tell who because uh, it was. I was not supposed to. I'm supposed to see the knife. Right? Oh really? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's this personal thing, right? So. Yeah, yeah, of course. Got a couple of good questions here. Yeah. Um, ha have you ever gone too thin on your knives now? Do I have thin knives way too much in the past when I was learning? That's from blank yeah. blank. The um, yes, I have done a few that like. Quite a few times, actually. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> everyone that has, especially when you are using that the like those wheels, uh, it often goes pretty far. Uh, and as you probably know, if you've gone too far, what would happen is that the uh, uh, the edge will start to flake off, like a um, yeah. like a um, foil, right? Yeah, it just starts to crumble away, like yeah. like there's nothing there. Yeah, it's a pretty bad feeling, <laughs> but yeah. it that's part of getting good. Like, it's like you learn to use salt by making some food too salty and some food not salty enough, and then eventually you just figure out how salty to make it. Yeah, um, I would the uh, usually, especially when I'm doing with the uh, I, when I'm learning with this wheel, this particular vertical wheel, uh, which I often go a little bit too far and thins out and. Uh, what happens is that the, it will create the profile um, to mess up. Yeah. Um, I always have the one stone sits right here that's flat. So when it starts to become very, uh, very thin, I come back and put the a little bit more aggressive edge on. Then I do back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, I would probably like say if I not so much with the uh, um, uh, by hand, but even if you're doing by hand and try to start to see that it's starting to become too thin, um, have the uh, one thousand stone next to you so that you can just debar it right off the butt. And yeah. also, one of the reason, one of the reason. The big reason, and I, I didn't know, but uh, one of the reasons that happens is often that knife is somehow distorted in terms of straightness, uh, flatness, and stuff. Right. So especially like when I was sharpening my Usuba, the single bevel veggie knife, I had like always had this spot on the knife that started to flake faster much earlier than any other part of the knife and i couldn't figure out why what happened was that the knife was slightly carved like this way oh yeah yeah and i was working just on the higher spot all the time right yeah basically just that that's the part that touches on the stone more right mm -hmm. so yeah interesting and who you know who uh, who pointed it out pointed it out? <laughs> Kevin. No, that was massage son. Oh uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. It was two massage son, Masashi Yamamoto, who we interviewed. Yes, who we interviewed yesterday. Yeah. And the uh, Masashi Fujara son, who I I went to get trained. Cool. Yeah, that. Uh... I'm looking forward to when you can travel back to Japan and, and learn even more from those people because the amount the amount that you learned in one trip is just absolutely insane. That was crazy because probably because I was solo. 
And I was like, holy, yeah. holy, I have to make it work rather than because <clears throat> you know, before a couple of trips before with Kevin, I I mean, you know, I was with Kevin. Obviously, I'm yeah, working. you're you're they're, they're taking you out for dinner and drinks, and you're kind of trying to visit a whole bunch of people in in, but, in one or two weeks. And when I'm by myself, um, you know, I have to prove that I worked actually, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was doing something, um, not just you know going out for dinner and drinks and have fun. So uh, I guess that worked out a little bit better than the uh, other trips that I did. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Gary Horn's got one that I just wanted to ask because he can't stick around, but said, uh, mm -hmm. wants to know which Nanoa stone the Knifeware 8000 is designed after, uh, and would it be a good option for polishing after thinning your knife? Yes. The uh, Gary, the 8000 is uh, the, the uh, same, very similar stone, the same stone as the Nanoa uh, 8000 Pure White. Yeah. And uh, pretty good for polishing after thinning. What the, do you think? As as long as you have that the evener bevel, that's great. If you yeah. have a bevel that's a little bit more too big on the convex, um, it may not work as good. But the if, as long as you have the really nice even thin bevel right. on that the uh, on the knife, eight thousand will work. So make sure that your your two twenty and your one thousand are really thin. Or, or sorry, are really flat before you. Yeah. Like make sure you do a really good job up front before you try to get get fancy with it. Yeah, like anything, right? The, uh... Yeah. Yeah, you want to focus on the the fundamentals before you go you go nuts. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's a great stone. It gives you such a nice edge too. So here. Um, yeah. We've got a good question from Anthony Barca. Mm -hmm. Is asking any tips to encourage my coworkers to sharpen their knives. They refuse to let me <laughs> teach them. Um, <clears throat> like, okay, so I, I've worked in a restaurant, and you, you, there's different kinds of cooks, and some of them are really invested in their tools, and you know, for them, cooking's an art, and they're they have all that passion, <clears throat> and and some people are there to get a paycheck, and and neither thing is there's there's no right or wrong reason to work in a kitchen but the the level of passion and extra time that somebody's going to want to spend is definitely going to vary that mm -hmm. said if you're having trouble getting your coworkers into it um maybe, just make sure you're not making it too difficult on them right like make sure you know maybe maybe let them try out your stones in case they don't have their own or um you know get them to sharpen something really basic and easy so they can feel like it's not a huge challenge and they're not really struggling with it you know anything to make it easy and fun i think would help maybe offer to buy them a beer if they stay stay around afterwards and and sharpen knives with you <laughs> after work that might be good encouragement um because i i really enjoyed sharpening my knives when i worked in restaurants but it was definitely a source of kind of stress and something that I, I didn't always have time for. So if you make it either, you know, into a group activity, uh, but you, you definitely try to take away any of the really challenging, tough, scary parts of it. I, I know I saw in the chat, you guys are working with pretty rough beater knives. Um, you know, the type that most professional kitchens get and they just get completely trashed. Those are going to be awful to sharpen. Those are going to be really like those, those are the knives that we learn on at Knifeware, but they're just the worst to, to learn if you want to have any fun sharpening. So, um, maybe, you know, if, if somebody has got a, a decent quality Henkel knife or, or victory knocks from school that you can practice on, that might be a better knife to get started with for them. Um, and, and they might be able to get some quick results. And, and feel a little bit better about it. That's that's kind of my two cents. What do you think, Nato? The um, it's really hard in, in Japan. If you're a chef, if you're a cook, you're pro expected to uh, know how to sharpen and learn how to sharpen stuff. Yeah. And every especially um, more traditional, more traditional than the restaurant gets. Um, you know, it's more strict, right? You basically stay until you sharpen all your knives and go home. And uh, and I don't expect the same thing here in North America. But, it's very different. It's yeah. knives are often seen as a a point of contention where it's like for a long time the attitude was like if you had fancy knives, you know, people would always almost make fun of you a little bit because it was I don't know. It, 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 there's a weird attitude about it, but there's a lot of 
cooks and chefs, even in some higher end restaurants that just don't view knives as a very important part of the process, mm -hmm. which is super strange. Um, it's kind of like if you didn't view, you know, tires as being an important part of your car. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's it, I think it's pretty old school attitudes that take I think a long it's time the, to uh, sense of ownership is very important when it comes mm. to the, uh, taking care of their own tools. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, if you are in the kitchen, um, all you have is those, the uh, general kitchen knives that, you know, does the work, um, the, the work that they're supposed to be doing, um, you know, they, you never get an ownership on that. And once you start to get into more, um, you know, higher end in terms of the uh, cooking skills and, uh, you know, more you, like it's, it's the, uh, <laughs> in, in, in Japan, we, we use the expression of a, um, um, uh, what you gonna call it? The uh, well, it's like you you basically step into that the uh, pond, like muddy pond. It's just like you know, <laughs> you try right. to get out of it, but it, it yeah, yeah, gets you sink in deeper and deeper. Um, I see, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, like sense of ownership. Once you start getting in and find the fun in the cooking, and not only just work, you know, cooking in general. Um, making beautiful food and it really comes down uh really to the um because really the basic of cooking is the uh, like the ingredient itself how it cuts and how you salt that's that's yeah. really the uh that's how it determines the very primitive way of cooking right yeah and more deeper you get into it um deeper you get into it i think you you just get the get a more interest in the uh, knives and yeah. you know and then you get a sense ownership of sense of ownership of taking care of that tool yeah totally yeah so um it is hard and i it based on so anthony followed up and said uh we have really nice stones and they're encouraged to sharpen on the clock they have brand new victory knocks knives they leave at home we sell expensive fish and they're so bad so I'll be honest. It sounds a, like a bit of a an attitude problem. Like maybe, maybe they just I, I don't want to say it out loud, but maybe they just don't care as much as you do, um, which sucks. Um, but I've worked with lots of cooks like that. You know, I I I've worked with lots of cooks where it's like you show them the right technique. You know, you show them to preheat a pan before you put the vegetables in, and then they just do it. They're, they put stuff into a cold pan, and they just they tell you it's the same. It doesn't matter, and you know, they, they don't bother sharpening their knives, even though they're d literally dull as a spoon. Um, yeah, if, if if you can inspire someone to care, I think that's that's a really big thing. But um, you might just need to look for people that do care. And uh, <laughs> unfortunately, true. if you're not in charge of hiring, that's that's a little bit tough. But um, yeah, I, I, I hate to say it, but you might you might just need to put your energy towards people that are worth the time. I get how frustrating it is. I have I have been there working in restaurants with people that just don't care and it's it's sad to see them treating food like that but it's uh eventually you gotta pick your battles and and start working with people who really do care and do love it because that's a lot more rewarding mm -hmm. and those good guys <clears throat> will stick right yeah. yeah yeah exactly i'm not saying quit your job don't quit your job <laughs> <laughs> sounds like you work at a great place yeah like <laughs> So how's the process going on your end now, Tom? It's pretty good. I've been just doing that the back and forth on that the uh, you know thinner at the tip, a little bit taller, or the, the little bit more at the heel. Um, it's getting pretty nice and even. There is no low spots. There is no um, you know weird reflection. It's actually pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it looks really consistent. And I'm just gonna do it. So there are a few uh, few ways to. Tell when to stop. That's really important, right? Because the uh, you don't want to go too far. Is it better? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. The uh, you don't want to go too far, uh, so that the as blank blank mentioned that the uh, the edge start to flake off. Right. Right. Um, you learn a few few tricks. Um, I do test with my fingers. I pinch my finger like this and i put the uh, edge here 
and slide. Don't cut yourself, <laughs> but slide like this way. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is how I tell how thin that knife is. And I touch this. If I if, if it's still too thick, it can I can feel it kind of jumps more. But like your finger jumps more. The, yeah, like there's it. It feels like this knife is like opening wedge in my those two fingers. Oh, uh, I see. Yeah, yeah. It sort of spreads your fingers apart a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Anthony, don't be sorry. I, I get it. <laughs> like I said, I get your frustration. Sometimes, sometimes you got to vent with people who understand. Yeah. If you, if you haven't joined our knife or Discord, uh, hit the link down in the comments. I know as a cook, you probably don't have a ton of spare time for chatting with people online, but uh, we talk about food, we talk about knives, we talk about sharpening. It's a fun little community space. There's uh, some knifeware customers and some knifeware staff in there, so it's a good little group of people. Yeah. So yeah, the um, got a very nice and even here. So it's in the back. It's pretty nice and thin. Um, thinness, well, if you want to test it, um, you could definitely have a, a carrot. <laughs> okay. Yeah. On the side. Yeah. You to cut it because you know carrot. You don't really need to make the last edge super sharp. So you, no, like, it, I, it's what, more about splitting it, right? Yeah. Because when I was uh, when I was uh, working at the store a little bit more, you know, pre-pandemic <laughs> era, um, um, uh, we at the stores we have the tomatoes, potatoes, and sometimes carrots kicking around for you know demo purpose purpose, right? I, I just go there and um, thin and test it on the carrot because yeah right what they, these knives are for it's to cut the uh, cut the food with yeah right so I really you know tr literally try and see how it wedges how smooth it glides and all that stuff before I proceed mm. this yeah, then you don't end up having to take a step back or several steps back. Yeah, yeah. So this particular stage, the first stone, 220 stone, I've been just, you know, chatting and I've, I've been just working out, working out away. Um, this is a really important step because you are building a fundamental of the bevel, how, how the bevel look, should look like, how thin the bevel be and everything. Hmm. So you're building the fundamental. Uh, yeah. You know, if you have the little bit low spots that you don't like, low spots or the concavity on the bevel is not all the bad. It happens. It right. happens because people use that the vertical wheel to grind the bevel. Yeah, yeah. and you see you know, the Masakage knives all the time. Yeah, or even like even some expensive, um, even some Hoyaki knives, they have a tiny bit of yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So it is natural to see that. And you don't have to be, you know, like I, I like to hide it, but the, you know, you don't sure. have to be super hustle. That, that, that's just purely an aesthetic preference, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the, um, but again, the, um, what you gonna call it? The, uh, what am I saying? If you st still see that the little concavity on the bevel and you no. don't like it, Make sure you go, you do something about it because that concavity on the bevel will not go away unless you try to, like, you know, grind, right. polish them and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. So, I, we've got a couple of good comments about thinning. So, maybe before we move on to your next stone, I, I, mm -hmm. I'm curious to address this. Blank Blank says, uh, I like mine just before the edge starts to flex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then Annabelle says, uh, You never follow the method of thinning until you get a burr. So how, how do you know when it's thin enough? If cutting carrots aside, yeah. is there a reliable way to tell if it's thin enough? That is very good question. I mean, you could, um, Annabelle, you could, you could definitely get it, do it until you raise the burr, but because especially the uh, tip, uh, like the uh, tip part of the knife, I'm sharpening at such a low and fine angle. Uh, raising the burr will definitely going to cause the uh, knife to flake off. And the um, once it starts to happen, what what will look like is that the uh, tip of the, the knife it will look like more like a burr's beak. 
Oh yeah, like where it thins out a little bit and then the yeah. point is just kind of hanging off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've definitely done that. So, um, <laughs> I'll try to avoid that. Depend. It also depends on how um, we call it the stick. Like I call it the how sticky the uh, steel is. Uh, the uh, stickier the steel, like a stainless steels are a little bit more uh, stickier. They don't uh, deburring and it's a little bit a little bit harder. Those guys, you could do it, but the um, hmm. I prefer not to go that far. Uh, again, you know, this is the uh, kind of kind of the uh, class or um, you know the the instructional video that the um, you know I I I think most people who's watching it, and especially for those of you uh, you know leaving a comment. Um, are doing the sharpening by themselves, right? Yeah, yeah. They don't have like a mentor to, mm -hmm. you know, so, they're uh, self-taught, so to speak, right? How thin? Um, one of the guidance is that the, uh, you know, as I was sharpening, as I was removing that the chip, I see the tiny bit micro bevel, the koba on the blade. I, you could do it until you don't see any of the micro bevel. Yeah, that's I think that, really that's how I learned. Yeah, that's really good indication. Um, when to stop. Okay, cool. Right. But if you do, like, so that's that's what the uh, black line says. Like, it's tiny bit, like, right before it started to flake off. Yeah. And the uh, if you're doing by hand, it's easier. If you're using the machinery, it's harder because the, it, yeah. that, that, that moment is, like, such, such, you know. I, I, I'm going to use my salt analogy again. I The way I learned to salt food was by adding little bits at a time. And sometimes I make things too salty and sometimes I don't make them salty enough. But over, over the several years, you you get better and better and better and you just keep keep practicing. And, yeah. you know, maybe don't go too thin on your nicest knife right away. <laughs> so, you know. Um, <clears throat> good question. So, actually, Nato, what, let's, let's uh, talk about what stone you're working on now because I don't think we mentioned that. Okay, so this one here, I uh, this is the stone that we don't sell, unfortunately. Um, this is the uh, Naniwa Hibiki stone. That is the we consider getting those in, but the uh, I ended up not because the uh, it kind of leaves the tiny bit of scratches on the be bevel. Great thing about this is that it's very very hard vitrified stone, but not as quite hard as the Itadaki. Um, this can be also another great um, checking stone for the bevel flatness. Okay. Instead of the white one that you were using, or at, at, at like you want to check it again. It's it's tiny bit softer, so easier to uh, sharpen a bit, little bit. Okay. You could do, definitely use the hibiki. Oh no, sorry, the itadaki. Um, what, what would be a good alternative to this one? The Hard 1000. Definitely this guy here. It's great. The uh, Kensho uh, Itadaki 1000. Yep. This is a bit hotter. Yep. You can kind of see, though. Like, I'll show you how, how they look like. Would the yeah. uh, would the Nanawacho Nana Sera professional be hard enough? Kind of works slightly bit. I, I'll, I do. Is this 1000? I'm just curious because I, I own it, so. I'll show you the uh, so this one. This is after Hibiki. Yeah. Pretty nice and even. Right. I'm gonna do it on this guy here. I did thin. Well, I did flatten this uh, stone before today. So. Nice. Somebody just called me from the warehouse. I don't know who it is. What? Is Ellie oh, still there? No. I thought Tiff is not here either. That's spooky. Now, so there might be a ghost in the building with you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Ted Chen has a good question. Uh, and this is one I want to know because this is something I need to do soon. I've got a Teriyasu Fujiwara Denka. Nice mm -hmm. knife that needs thinning. What progression would you recommend? Anything specific about Fujiwara's that I need to pay attention to while I'm thinning it? The uh, Fujiwara Sans bevel um, is a bit more rustic <laughs> to mm. uh, 
say say it nicely. His yeah. uh, his levels are a little bit more rustic. Uh, his Koba, the last last edge is fantastic. Bevel could be a little bit more off. So I would definitely start from something very coarse. Um, Knife or 220, uh, Shapton Glass 220 to start. Make sure you have you make the bevel really nice and even. Then progression, we are probably going to do a uh, uh, p- 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 some 1,000. I you could like if you want to um, if you want to skip the process of checking the uh, flatness of the bevel, you can do knife for 1,000 and knife for 4,000 to finish. Um, if you like like this uh, video live stream right now, like to do a super super nerdy about it, you can do a uh, um, 220. Some very hard 1,000 and make sure the bevel is flat. Then soft 1,000, like knife or 1,000, and either uh, knife or 4,000 or uh, something like Kensho uh, K3,000 to finish. But okay. So here, I touched it a little bit. If I do it slowly, you see that the light, it kind of uh, has weird reflection it's not as even as it was before hmm. yeah because if this one stone here is harder it touches on the uh the on the spot rather than the whole um uh, whole bevel what that means is that this leaves a little bit more uneven finish you see a tiny bit yeah. of Yeah. And if you are looking to get the very similar, I'll try, I'm going to try this 1000 here. This is very interesting, though, because the those three, uh, I'm going to use actually four different the uh, 1000 stone. <laughs> four different 1000 stones. Today. Oh, just, just to, to demonstrate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's not your regular process. No, no, no. <laughs> that's good. This actually isn't too bad. This uh, knife wear, um, not not a knife wear, the Pro or Chosera, formerly known for as a Chosera. Yeah. Which I really didn't like before. <laughs> what? It kind of sits in between. The uh, uh, the Hibiki yeah. 1000 and the Kensho Itadaki 1000, okay. except the uh, it is slightly finer, so it gives you a little bit more shinier polish at the edge. Yeah, I've noticed that. I was gonna I was gonna call you out because you sold me that stone, but that was like that was like eight years ago. So it's good stone. It's the uh... <laughs> it's fine. It's good enough for Nathan. No, it's, it's gray stone. It cuts really fast. And by the, the time yeah. that we were doing, not so much on the bevels. It was great. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, but, I, I actually just sharpened the edge of my Denka on that stone, and I just finished it there. I just dropped it, and it it's working really nicely. Oh, yeah. Edge is great. Yeah, don't, don't get me wrong. It is gray stone to finish your edge with. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't give necessarily the Kasumi finish that I would yeah, want. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. Um, another good question from Anthony Barca, who's the one, the the, the person that sharpens, uh, chef that sharpens knives and, and deals with fish a lot. Um, what kind of finish do you recommend to minimize friction against fish meat? Lower grit seems to work better, but I'm not sure. The, um, yes, the... If it's a f- uh, fish is super fresh, like a um, and a white meat, they are a little bit more tougher. Like say, um, so there are in the uh, when I was talking to Masashi Fujiwara-san, who is the uh, the sharpener in in Japan, he uh, he has this almost like subscription service uh, to the chefs. Oh really? Say so like you know. It's, X uh, dollars to the, the uh, this guy. Yeah. And he basically sharpens like any time they want. Uh, oh, cool. What That's he told smart. me, what he told me is that the uh, finishes that he does on the bevel, 
uh, for chefs in the, in the Eastern Japan mm -hmm. and the Western Japan are different. Right, because the, the, the water is going to be different on either no, side. No, the the, right? how they treat the fish is different. Oh, really? Traditionally, in the uh, in the Kansai or the west um, of Japan, like western area where I'm from, the fish, fresher the fish is, better. That's hmm. a um, common uh, belief. Right. right. In the east, it was kind of hard, especially in Tokyo area. So, what they did is that Edo Maya style sushi, the Edo, the Tokyo style sushi, is that the uh, they have to do something, like either they, you know, vinegar make a vinaigrette, they age them, or they do something to right. the fish. Yeah, uh, it's either cured or it's. Like, it's almost like a uh, you know the uh, aging a beef. It's the same. Uh, reaction will happen in the meat, like fish as right. well. Yeah. If you fish, well yeah, yeah. Especially, especially when the fish is slaughtered, like killed properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is so, very different from how it's handled here. Exactly. So yeah. if it's the uh, aged, and often in uh, Tokyo style sushi, uh, fish is fish, or not as a uh, fresh. Um, so they right. They have a little bit more stickier feel, right? Okay. Well, here, here's a here's a clarifying statement. Mm -hmm. The fish is super fresh there in Hawaii, and yeah. tuna is the most difficult one. Okay, so tuna. The uh, so some places in Tokyo there are some aged tunas, right? Mm, right. Aged tunas are more like um, red meat. It actually gets a yeah. little bit more stickiness to it. Yeah. When you're trying to cut those tunas, the sticky tunas, you want to make the bevel almost like a mirror. So it glides. Right. If it's a fresher, like especially white fish, like a uh, sea bream, and that's a little bit more tougher meat, um, you want actually to have a tiny bit more like a regular kasumi finish. So slightly rougher. Yeah. But not, not super coarse. Not, not super coarse. Okay. The um, and that's what the distinction that uh, the Fujira, Masashi Fujirao-san makes. So interesting. Be between the two halves of Japan. Yeah. So the um, when you're cutting the very fresh, because you still want to have enough. Um, say when you're doing that the uh, sashimi slicing tuna, um, you still want to make your bevel smooth enough that it doesn't you know pull your right. fish like yeah you, yeah if, it's you make, if you make your bevel too um coarse uh, you know tuna will just gonna you know stick to your blade and it shifts right <laughs> yeah too much yeah. surface surface area for it to yeah. stick. It's, it's it's terrible for the uh uh what you call it it's terrible for um uh salmon salmon really easy to uh, flake off yeah so uh for those tunas the very fresh uh fish i will probably gonna finish uh something like a uh two probably up to two thousand or three thousand on that the bevel here so that it doesn't it's smooth but it's not like mirror polish right yeah okay cool So you're working on 1,000 now, right? This one here, I actually uh, doing back and forth. So I, I showed <laughs> you the uh, uh, 1,000 finish with the Chosera. Yeah. This here, it's the uh, Shapton Glass 1,000. Okay. So this one here, I use the Kensho uh, Itadaki 1,000. I use the Hibiki 1,000. I use uh, Pro 1,000. And now I'm using that. This is the fourth 1,000 I'm using. And every one of them have that slight different look to it. The way I'm sharpening is the same. And from my experience, um, for this particular knife, I like the uh, the um, what should I call it? The uh, Hibiki 1000 uh, best of this four. But it's 
Hmm. So it gets really nice, even finished though. Cool. It's a preference thing. Um, okay. And Anthony says, uh, "Thanks for the insight, Nauto. You are like an encyclopedia." I try to. <laughs> it's very so true. I try to because the. Uh, um, you know, being the being the expats in a different country, um, I don't. I try to be like I don't. I I, I see myself like as a. Um, I try to act like I'm the only Japanese person anybody see. You know, meet. Yeah. And, I mean, in, in many cases, you might be. Yeah, and if that if that Japanese person doesn't know anything about Japanese culture, history. Anything mm. about your country? Um, it's like, you know, that's 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 the impression that it gives to the person, right? Like, yeah, right. Oh, Japanese people don't know about their thing, like. <laughs> huh. Well, I mean, I mean, people in North America are very bad about knowing about Japanese culture to begin with, except for the people that are really into it. So, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I feel like it's that that's a very noble thing to do to to try to represent it as well as you can. Yeah, like, and I like histories, and I like those stories, and, and I like to share that too, right? Yeah, that's, that's that's this is a part of what I, what we do, right? That is my one of my favorite parts. Besides the crazy knife repairs, one of my favorite parts about following you on Instagram um, is getting to see the food that you make at home because it just it it all looks so good, but it's also interesting to learn about the specific dishes and like what mm -hmm. you know what you eat in the summer specifically and what's right. you know um you know stuff beyond sushi and ramen which everybody knows you know right, right. dishes that you haven't heard of but are equally or even more so delicious if anybody I, wants to see amazing japanese food and knife repairs uh follow that on instagram so uh, he's, his, his account is pretty legit there's some cool stuff there i still um i still watch him for that i still make those like you know sushi and ramen as well but ramen i i make it from the broth <laughs> there's a couple couple ramens that i made previously they, they are pretty good nice so the um here um thinning once you start to have that nice bevel let's come back to you know actual lear learning part <laughs> um you can definitely choose your own uh favorite 1000 this here um, I personally like it's not because I work for the uh, knife war, but I do like this uh, knife war 1000. Uh, before I get into the really um, nice kasumi finish, reason this is not as quite hard stone 1000 stone as the, the those four that I was using, it's quite soft. So, from this and Tiny bit shiny along the edge here. This will actually going to hide. And this will actually smoke whole bevel up, but very evenly. Very evenly. Yeah, because consistency is kind of the the name of the game here, hey? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier there were a few a few different ways that you can go about thinning a knife. And mm -hmm. you're obviously like, you know, you're you're thinning out the tip of the knife more. And then, and then, kind of making the the heel a little thicker. What were the other ways that people would potentially do that? The, I mean, you can just definitely um, work all the way uh, the same angle. I don't recommend it because the um, uh, sometimes when you do, you are making that the heel part of the bevel too high um, and stuff like that. Um, what did I mention? The different ways of thinning. <laughs> what was I saying? Well, well, we, we, can, we can come back to that because yeah. um, I've got a couple of good questions here. Uh, Annabelle says, do you make 
uh, slurry to help you be uh, to help make a more continuous finish, or do you clean the stone as you go? The um, slurrier stone, <laughs> say like this one here, I'll keep the slurry on. Yeah. The um, coarser stones, like two twenty. I, you know, you don't see that the slurry as much as well, so I won't worry too much about them. I don't okay. particularly wash everything out. I just use this slurry, especially slurry comes super handy on the much finer uh, stone, actually. So 1,000, it still works, but it's not as important um, as it gets to a little bit, like one finer, like one full thousand, the, uh, the slurry comes very handy. Okay, cool. That makes sense. I, uh, for whatever reason, I kind of learned to like keep your stones really clean when I when I started sharpening, and I kind of stuck with that. So I'm excited to experiment with using the slurry a little more. Okay, so it's a little bit more even. I have to oh, yeah, remember wow. how the uh, this bevel was this tall, but. I tried to like I have I had an intention to have the this bevel line higher up here, so it's definitely higher the this bevel line or the shinogi line mm -hmm. is definitely higher than the original though, because I don't think those yeah that's quite tall spots are not there. Tall bevels are great. But I like the multiple angle um, approach as well, right? So you have the very tall angle at the tip. Yep. But doesn't have to have it very that tall angle at the heel. For those of you who watched the uh, the video, uh, the live interview yesterday, there are three pictures that we didn't get to actually show. One of which is the uh, kind of secret project that we may be working on, or the Masai-san may be working on. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm very excited. I thought you were gonna sh you were gonna let the the cat out of the bag there. I'm very excited for that. I I wanted to. Well, I mean, there is actually uh, the that thing is saved on there, right? Well, we'll we'll show that off a little bit later. Later, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a you'll have to we'll we'll do it once you're done so you can you can really walk us through what's going on there. Uh, but, blank yeah. blank or uh, not blank blank fighting you six says uh, happy Friday all thanks for tuning in buddy good to see you. Yeah. Let us know what you're cooking this weekend. You're always making something good. Um, <clears throat> great question here from Lorenzo. This is probably something a lot of people are wondering. Aside from this situation. When would you recommend thinning a knife? Every X number of knife sharpenings, or is it a different mentality uh, when you say it's time to thin a knife? So, like, yeah, how how often would you do it? And how often would you recommend the average person does it? Uh, if you're like, if you like to sharpen, if you like to thin your knife, um, you can definitely do it every time, every every single time that you sharpen. The once you make your edge really nice and. Uh, thin and after this I do put the uh, micro bevel on it as well so it's not as thin as the uh, right after it you uh, I thin them right so um, I do it pretty much every time I you know take out my knives uh, take out my uh, stones to sharpen stones to sharpen yeah um, keeping it to thin a blade is much easier than to make it thin, right? Yeah, big time. So, um, like, say if you're just like casually, uh, if you're like casual cook at home, um, oftentimes you don't always have to go back down to uh, 220 to grind that much of metal off either. Right. But, yeah. If you want to maintain that the same uh, sharpness, and I mean casual cooks like like myself at home, uh, I don't sharpen them like every day at all, right? Like I I sharpen them um, once probably like three six six months to a year depends right. on the month. and yeah. It, it's funny because you said you know if you if you like to sharpen then you you should do it every time, but. I would even say if you don't like knife sharpening and you do it out of necessity, 
you should definitely do it every time because having to thin a knife that you sharpened a few times is so much worse than having to thin it every time. <laughs> yeah, we, we've had a, we, we have a few knives coming in like that. I'm like, yeah, ah, you should have just brought it every time instead of like working by yourself. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It can be. It can be really bad. Sometimes you've sharpened like they've sharpened off the whole bevel, and then, then it's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen. Uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of knives. That's you know they they like to sharpen, and after you know ten knife sharpenings, and the bevel is so thick that realize that it's not working as as good as it should be. Mm -hmm. And they send to us saying, "Hey, this knife is not cutting us. It's good." Yeah, and yeah, it's you, going dull really fast. <laughs> and you, you, you see the knife like, oh, yeah, that's." Uh, <laughs> yeah, I keep it, sharpening it, but it only stays sharp for a week. Yeah, it's because this is what happens, and we explain, and you know, we do that. And bad thing is, well, good thing for the customer is that we do a first time sharpening for free. Even yep. after uh, 10 or 20 or even like, you know, quite a bit of sharpening by themselves, first time sharpening that it's done. Nice that you buy from us that the first time sharpening yeah. is always free. It's your get out of jail free card in those situations. Yeah. But even if we have to spend like, you know, a couple of hours bringing that the knife into the, the proper shape, like it's free. Yeah. Um, Craig is a great great comment he says idea for future episode learning about japanese food from naoto yeah we're yeah. uh we're, we're actually going to do a couple of nice skills videos where naoto uh basically yeah like uses knives shows you some technique and then also makes some food with, with what he's cut yeah what, what were you what were you gonna cook in those videos i was naoto? gonna do a uh the because I, I like to show the not a technique but you know show the cutting more right so i was thinking the uh, asian slaw asian yeah yeah asian slaw and i think i was saying something you know basically cutting a whole bunch of cabbage <laughs> that's what it was i think cabbage and the asian yep. slaw is not necessarily like japanese japanese food but you know we we actually incorporate Lots of uh, different cultures, like you know, like a Canadian culture, like any culture. I think food travels faster than the you know anything else, right? <laughs> yeah, <but> no kidding. <laughs> so um, yeah, we um, I often cook those at home. Um, I think I have a few uh, pictures that I made on the on my Instagram account because uh, yeah, it's fun because I I get to cut. Cabbage, I get to cut carrots, uh, cilantro, um, red onion, and super, super fine. So I, I'll do that. Yeah, it's a nice, uh, those dishes are really nice to just almost like to break in a new knife and just see how delicately you can cut everything. Yeah. We'll have to, we'll have to use that new, uh, the new Fujimoto line for that. I find that, uh, like those, I was able to get some really, really nice cuts of that. I was uh, using the sample on yeah. last weekend, and I was yeah. like really shredding some Brussels sprouts for for uh, a slaw, and it was super, super good. We, at that. Are we? We're we're still like about a week away until that we. Yeah, they're they're gonna head to stores this coming week, and so they'll they'll launch in about a week or so. Yeah. Probably next week. Oh, yeah, we we work the uh, this knife line go. New Fujimoto line. It's very simple, white carbon um, steel with iron clad. Um, and that's, yeah, super simple, crochy, really well made knife for very, very good price. Will be available pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited. I've been, like I said, I've been using the sample. It's been a lot of fun. Um, TJ Ronan has a good, well, a question here. I'm not 100% sure, but it says stock take. Water stones. So it's got a collection of water stones, I'm guessing. And mm -hmm. it's wondering what you should add. What what he should add. Um I, I'm guessing this is the collection that he has already. Uh six thousand mm -hmm. grit, eight thousand grit, three thousand, and twelve hundred. If that's what he has already, then I assume you'd want to probably add something rougher than than yeah, the twelve hundred. One thousand is definitely something that you you have to have. The yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, do you think, but if you have a, if you have a 1200, do you need a 1000 or would you just want to get like a four? Oh, yeah, oh, sorry. 1200. Sorry. I, yeah. I thought the 12,000. Yeah. 12, right. uh, no, I might've no. said that. No, the, um, no, the 1200 is fine. Like medium grid is like two, uh, 800 to uh, 1200 or even 1500 grids are very similar, works very similar. Right. Um, or recommend that, you know, like if, if he's asking to add one, six, one, like one of each in that, those grits, um, I definitely, yeah, maybe. depends on the, um, the type of finish, what, what you're trying to do, um, like 6,000, if you're trying to get the really nice, I'm starting to actually get the very nice Kasumi on here. Oh yeah. Look at that. Uh, yeah, it's like really nice, right? Um, if you're trying to get a really nice Kasumi, uh, one of the 6,000 I like is the um, uh, Kitai, uh, Arashiyama 6,000 Nankuchi, which is the one we sell. Nankuchi means the softer uh, stone. They are great to get the really nice Kasumi. Um, Kasumi, for those of you who don't know, means you know it's got a really shiny and uh, smoky um, clotting. 8,000. Um, Depends again on how you want to um, have the finish. The uh, knife where I want 8,000 or the uh, Nanyo traditional 8,000 is great for um, the edge, last edge. Um, also, the finishing a chisel, so plain blades on those 8,000s are great. 3,000. One of the 3,000 I actually like, besides this particular one that I'm using right now, this is my favorite because it just gets easy uh, Kasumi on them. Uh, one of the uh, favorite uh, 3,000 is actually, um, I've used a few, I don't think we have them right now, but the uh, Naniwa Super 3,000. Oh, They're I have that one. Soft, you know, it's, uh, it's got very nice, you can get a really nice Kasumi. It's very thin. Uh, well, the money very, very soft, yeah. Yeah. And I'll, if you I'll like try that, that one out, I haven't tried doing a Kasumi finish for that one. It's it's great. It's nice and soft. If you like to have the more um, the precise edge, the like Wang Wang Sang, the Naniwa Pro three thousand is great. I I love to finish my last edge with that one. It's just mm. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, that 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 is like I love sharpening, like do, doing yeah, exactly. doing the final edge on that stone. It's such a great stone. Um, D Hop Three Ten's got a great question here. Uh, any tips for thinning a mono steel knife with no shinogi line? Yeah, the uh, we can cover that on the a few. Um, we we more. did we did do a night a video on thinning a knife without a primary bevel a while mm -hmm. ago. Um, I can do mono steel sometimes. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, I don't have any mono steel here. I'll scout through and let's do that. The mono steel. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Great thing about mono steel, just to talk about the mono steel. Um, and for those of you who's watching who don't know, like what the mono steel means, mono steel. Um, you know, it's it means the uh, one steel, right? Uh, Japanese knives usually are made with two different types of steel, hard steel and soft steel. Hard steel for the edge, soft steel for the outside layer for protection. Uh, mm -hmm. Mono steel knives are made with just one piece of steel, usually yep. uh, hard and slightly uh, softer, um, unless it's honyaki, which is like, you know, super, super high end. Um, so the mono steel knives, Biggest advantage of the mono steel knives is that you can sharpen them into something um, very um, customizable. Basically, let's let's put it this way: because those these knives, like the knives that I'm sharpening here, it's a three layer. It's got a core. It's got a uh, it's got a cladding on the outside. So it's like a pencil. You won't always make sure to expose the core uh, carbon, right? Where Mono steel. So if you say if you have the pencil, if you cut it in like si like slight sideways like this, and if that the core is just not exposed, you can't write with it, right? Where um, right. Mono steel, even if you cut it like this way, uh, you can still use. It's still usable. Um, 
So yeah. I've got um I have the knifeware, like the, the knifeware brand one that we did years ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, the it's Swedish steel and I've got the two ten Sujihiki. That's a mono steel, isn't it? Yeah. I have well, the, if, you, if you need a mono steel knife to sharpen, hey, you're welcome I, I to do sharpen still have uh, I, I have two seventy knifeware. Oh, nice! Yeah, that would be that would be a good one to to, to do. That's like really thin to begin with, so it's kind of hard. Yeah, that that's a trick. I'm I'm kind of afraid to thin it, but yeah, um, I may have to uh, look for something like global, or something like um, right. Um, I bet Mike's got an old, old global. You could uh, you could thin out for him. Yeah, global or the um, Mac. Yeah. 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 Uh, fighting you, says I'm still waiting on my yesterday morning. I was peeling a mountain yam. Now to a knife wear logo T-shirt. <laughs> well, we'll have to get Mason to to draw that one up. Yeah. <laughs> um. <clears throat> oh, hey. Blank Blank uh, got a chance to do uh, a rotary cut the other day, making pickled daikon, and it went well. Nice. That's that's a tough skill to, <clears throat> to pull off. So well done. Yeah, that's a skill. I I I could peel, per se, with that uh, knife, but I can't really do the uh, um, yeah that yeah. like very long rotational peel, rotary peel. So D Hop was wanting. Speaking of thinning, uh, was wanting oh, yeah. to thin uh, Kramer Carbon by Zwilling, eight inch right, right. knife. Yeah, I'm familiar with that knife. The uh, yeah, I can definitely um, talk about it. The uh, you know I can have the drawing, and this is how you want to do. And yeah, if you want to, yeah, I'm like I, I I've seen you. Quite a quite some time, so uh, I'm sure yeah. you you. Uh, so when we do, we will uh, announce it, so you can check that one out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, good question from Lorenzo here. When thinning, how would you approach harder versus softer metals or carbon versus stainless? When would you have a different approach for those? The um, not so much on um, different approach in terms of the um, the harder steel, softer steel because um, angles and stuff like that are very similar. Um, harder steel, softer steel, not so much on that the, um, it's more like when I'm actually doing this, uh, what it's really uh, matter is the how, we, we call it the how wear resistant those uh, st steels are. Uh, wear resistance means the, it's, it could be hard, but it doesn't want to be ground. Um, yeah. So um, say I'll be super like this is one of those knives that they don't want to be ground as fast as the white carbon steel. So I take a little bit more. Um, it just feels like it slides. So I take a little bit more time. Um, in terms of basic technique, it shouldn't change. Um, okay. Stone, how they react, like how the outer layer the softer steel reacts to certain stones yes definitely there are some differences so i'll have to find sometimes that the best combination that i can get the best finish on mm -hmm. but when it comes to the uh thinning approach like you know to make the bevel um create or the create the bevel that is uh functional and how how it should function um Approach shouldn't be different, that much different. Okay, cool. I mean, if it's like super soft, I wouldn't make it too thin. Yeah. Say, say this way, yeah. I guess I was I was talking relatively hot, hotter st steels, but I guess that's that that makes sense. Hopefully. Yeah, I think so. Um, <clears throat> Annabelle says. Uh, when you go too far and flex the knife, which they did, what can you do to fix it? Make a coba? Um, oh, the like, yeah, make it the uh, make the like made the steel too, too thin, thin, so it so it flexes. Yeah, yeah, the uh, do it coba. As I said, I always usually have the uh, stone right beside, like this, 
and I just when it start to become too thin, I just put the uh, cova very lightly. And cool. I, often happens when I'm doing say it happen often happens the uh, when I'm thinning a knife that the the edges uh, the core edges not in the cent on the center. Sometimes it's like tiny bit offset. So when I'm yeah. sharpening and it, like when we do the uh, more um, well mass not a mass produce but when we do but more in volume uh, I use this uh, wheel here right? right. So when I'm sharpening on one side and thinking that the the edge the core steel is in the center, but when I'm working on both ends and try to grind in a, about same like equal numbers. You see the one side of the edges exposed too much than others. When I when mm -hmm. that happens, say when the right hand of this this side of the steel is exposed too much and it shows like yeah. very little here. Yeah. I put the cover on this side and thin. Oh. It. oh. Okay. Cool. That makes sense. Yeah. So that's how sometimes I have to do because. It has been very, you know, trendy to a uh, show the koba or to show the uh, core steel, a lot of core steel. Um, sometimes, though, you know, too much exposure means it's vulnerable for chipping. Yeah, so, that makes sense. Yeah, and also unevenness is not necessarily great, really, because the um, if you think um, so. A little bit nerdy stuff, but those uh, steel, that's hardened steel, uh, can change in volume over time. And single bevel knives often, they like to a, uh, say, you know, the single bevel knives, because it has hard steel and the softer steel, so two different, st two steels laminated this way. Uh, when this hardened steel over time, they like to actually shrink in a little bit. When it shrinks, it pulls to this way a little bit. Hmm. Um, what I'm trying to say is that the when there is the more um, clad steel on the one side and there is none here, that part will have a little bit of distortion. In the oh, interesting. Because um, like, there's unequal pressure on either side. Yeah. Oh, weird. Well, not ideal. No. Not ideal. Hmm. So Blank Blank's got a, a good one here. Needs a bit of help. Polishing by Tojiro Nakiri on the Rika 5K right now. Mm -hmm. About to move to Kiriyama after that. Then mm -hmm. Naturals. These VG10 DPs are hard to get a good polish on. Yeah. Uh, any tips for getting... A good, I know you love VG10, Naoto. Uh... <laughs> Any tips for getting a good finish on my DP Nakira? I'm having a hell it, of a time. It didn't party. even get to my uh, favorite steels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> so, do you have any tips for for getting a nice polish on that? Those are DP uh, polish. I those ones I often you know like. Are you talking about bevel polish? I often just try to make the uh, convex grind. And after a certain point, I use the um, sandpaper to blend it. So it's kind of, you know, it's a little bit of cheat way. It's hard though, especially for those VPs and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's how I do. Because you know, how, how Polish do you want that? Because if it's for yourself, you can definitely spend a lot of time. If it's for, say, sharpening for someone else, I wouldn't spend that much time. Yeah, right. Oh, talking about the primary bevel. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, I guess that's what you're talking about. Yeah, that's what I figured. Uh... Oh, the primary bevel. Yeah, the um, primary, secondary, primary. Yeah. This is primary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming we're all using the same terminology here. I think so. I'm sure it's not koba, is it? Yeah. It, the primary. No, I, I think I think it's the like the bevel bevel, right? Bevel is the bevel is primarily. Yeah. So I, I usually have them to make it when I have to thin the DP. I 
grind it like this way, the more convex grind, because uh, DP has the uh, so-called hairline finish. Uh, no. If I want to make it a little bit more polished, I will um, I will basically grind whole hairline vertical lines off with the, some different stones yep. and um, polish them with the um, sandpaper. Okay. Yeah. That makes again, sense. again, the uh, for most people who buy the Tojiro DP Nakiri to thin. They are not expecting to be like mirror mirror polish. Yeah. Well, this this is blank blank's own own Tokyo. Right. So okay. I think, I think the, the goal is to get it really really nice. I'm guessing. Right. Um, <clears throat> Rob Carson is back with the Usuba questions. Yeah. Any, any tips for thinning a single bevel knife, especially in Usuba where you want to keep the edge very flat? Mm -hmm. Usuba is the. Uh... There is a lot of tips there. Yep. Um, the um, I can definitely go over the single bevels. The Suba is the hardest uh, probably knife to sharpen, to sharpen good. Um, really important, first, like a couple steps are very similar. Make sure your, um, your knives are straight, flat on the back. In order to sharpen the whole bevel evenly, you want to make sure that the whole bevel is flat when you actually put on the stone, it just touches flat. Right? Yeah. So that the one port one part is not the grinding faster than others. That's really the import what first important thing. Also, the usuba, when it's like hand forged usuba, it has that the thicker at the heel and tapers it down. They are actually naturally sharpen like this lower a little bit lower at the tip and higher angle at the heel lower higher so when you see the my finger positioning here i'm just gonna actually i'm just gonna actually have it a little bit more higher from top down so you can see a little bit better See here, it's a little bit taller, higher. Okay, so my finger position for the usuba is going to be. Can I see? It's better. Which one is better? It's probably okay. Either way. So when I'm sharpening the usuba tip part, I put the pressure on the bevel part here, like on the bevel or something. When I'm sharpening the heel, I put it at the heel very at heel so my positioning of the finger is going to be this diagonal line from here to here same as so when you're sharp it's going to be like this right this is deba but it's like a suba so my finger line pressure point is going to be higher here and comes down diagonally to the heel like this if you right. maintain that it's pretty easy to actually uh, do okay cool yeah i know i know rob's got a repair that he's got to do it's Ooh. a bit of an unfortunate situation and Ooh. and the usuba was uh it's the same one i used to have it's the i think it's the uh formerly the masakage uh okay. single bevel series i think um but it, it it got it got dinged up pretty bad. So oh. the, uh, the the it sounds like the Ottawa guys might end up uh, fixing it first. But right. But uh, who knows? Maybe maybe Rob will give it a go. And uh, Rob says thank you very much. Yeah. If it's like two one sixty five mil, relatively short, it's relatively easier to do. Uh, I had to sharpen a uh, two ten for myself. Yep. Was not Ooh. straight. It was terrible. Oh. Uh, that, sounds, that was the one that I had struggled with a lot. Sounds not super fun. No, no, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. Um, Annabelle is wondering what stone progression you're using today. Alrighty, so I, I actually, you know, jumped over <laughs> quite a few. So I started out from the well for thinning. I started out from the uh, Shopton glass 220. Then I 
did the um, I did a various different 1000 grit. I started from this a uh, Naniwa Hibiki 1000. Then I right before I actually um, blend those in, I was using a um, so I was using a Shopton glass 1000. So progression you can take is um, Shopton glass 220, Shopton glass 1000. Then I moved to the a uh, Knifer 1000, softer, so it blends all out. Then I finished basically to make it look like this with the uh, Kensho K3000. Yeah. Then I'm going to finish the edge with the uh, this 1000 and uh, one side with the 6,000 later on. <laughs> cool. Uh, okay. Speaking of which, uh, Fighting Yusuke has a good question. It says, uh, Nato, if we weren't bugging you, how long would this session typically take you? This session? Yeah. Typically, the uh, like just regular sharpening, if I'm like, like by myself. Yeah, small repair, thinning. Um, probably I sometimes jump like, and I was like playing around with the, uh, some zones and stuff like that. It's this particular one, like 20, 30 minutes. That's pretty good. That's yeah. pretty quick. <laughs> and, and you, I mean, you would probably use the wheel for part of it. Hey, yeah. Part of it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, uh, that device sure is amazing. <laughs> it really speeds things up. Often the uh, I do it with the uh, some other knives. I don't usually work just on one knife. So um, when I say work, um, say when I like do the uh, five knives on the same condition. Yep. It probably takes the uh, an hour to do a five. Right. Then average is what. <clears throat> right, like, because you're you're. Yeah. Doing them all on one stone and doing them, yeah. you're saving time yeah. on, in steps. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's it, definitely the, the the way to do it if you're able to. Yeah, that's faster that way, but and yeah, Rob has the one. It's a 180 uh, Masakage Usuba with a Kurochi finish. And uh, yeah. The Ottawa guys get to do it for sure, but yeah, it, ask, I, I think Rob uh, will be sharpening it after they repair it. Yeah, ask the uh, ask um, Alex. Yeah. Don't ask Chris. He doesn't know anything about sharpening knives. <laughs> he can. He sure can use chopsticks, but he can't. He can't sharpen a knife. <laughs> While you're uh, working on that now, Tom, I'm gonna I'm gonna blast through a little bit of news real quick. Is that cool? Yeah, 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 so, absolutely. So we've got, uh, as always, we've got uh, some good live streams coming up. Um, We've got on Tuesday uh, for Japanese Knife 101 at 1 p.m. Mountain Time uh, is going to be Knifeware Quiz Show. It's going to be Knifeware Quiz Show 2, the electric boogaloo. So uh, Kevin and Lordy are going to ask all sorts of all sorts of weird questions about knifeware and, and knives and all sorts of stuff. Uh, some of the answers might not even make sense, but uh, whoever wins gets a prize. That's exciting. <laughs> Uh, and then on Thursday, the guys are going to be talking about sharpening chukabocho, uh, which is in Japan what they call a Chinese cleaver. Um, so different style of knife with some different kind of purposes, um, very multi-purpose and in terms of, you know, maybe sharpening different parts of the blades different ways. Uh, so that'll be Francis and Owen as always. And then uh, Friday next week, it's going to be, what are we doing? I, for I forgot completely. I'll there find out shortly. Sorry, guys. Uh, I believe it's it, which which stones should I use? So we're going to be talking a lot about wet stones next week. Sure, that's great. That's great. I believe that's the topic. Let me double check. Uh, which sharpening stones are best for my knife? So we'll go over some basics, but then probably pretty quickly it'll descend into uh, nerdy madness of of getting into the semantics of different stones and what are best for for sharpening really particular knives. So if anybody, any of the viewers have a very specific knife that they want to sharpen or polish or whatever, and you want Nato's advice on what stone to use for that kind of steel, that's really what we're going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to have- I also 
Also, think about the what you are using the knife for as well. Yes, totally. Um, yeah, it uh, should be a good one. You know, we love nerding about, out about stones. Um, I won't be here next week. We'll have a couple of couple of guests over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'm gonna do some camping, so uh, yeah. I'll see you guys in in a few weeks here. But I'll still be on the Discord and stuff. Uh, I think we might have Chris Armitage, believe it or not, uh, hosting an episode or two with Nalto, uh, and we might see if we can get someone else as well. Ooh, here, let me let me blow that up there. Cause that looks really nice. Wish that, uh, Damn, I, I can see I can see the computer screen and the knife edge. Uh, wish that the uh, camera is better. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring the Sony back and uh, maybe we'll just, just leave it at the warehouse permanently. And yeah, you guys can just have it ready to go there. I have long enough hair to test the if it's like that. Oh yeah, this is this is <laughs> this is a good one. You see certain some blacksmiths doing that testing. He, yeah, testing it on the back of their head. Yeah. It's yeah. it's a it is a good trick though. It works really well. Yeah, it kind of you know touches and grabs and pulls. You can tell, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, another good show we're going to be doing in two weeks. Uh, I, I called it Stump the Wizard. So you have to bring you, the viewers, so this is your homework over the next two weeks, you have to come up with your most challenging sharpening questions. Um, you know, they can't be cheating questions, but they could bring your most like technical questions and you're trying to stump now to uh, try to try to get like the most extreme <laughs> questions answered that you can. So I want all you guys to work on that over the next couple of weeks, and there'll I'm sure there'll be some really really good stuff. Uh, I'm not uh, that good. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like putting lower the burr right now. <laughs> Yusik, I am not taking an axe out camping. I'm probably going to take five or six axes out camping because uh, <laughs> they haven't camp. seen the light of day for a while. So it's about yeah. time. So how's that? Do you do you want to before we do some more questions? Do you want to talk about that knife at all? We can kind of wrap up the uh, the sharpening portion of this video. You mean that knife or that this knife or that, that knife? That that knife that's like hitting in the back as my drawing. Oh no no no! Let's oh, talk about okay. this one first. We'll okay. we'll finish the sharpening and then we'll then we'll talk about other stuff. So yeah, this one here uh, just finished with the uh, the cobalt with the uh, last uh, last bit of uh, micro bevel with the six thousand stone right here. Uh, I was quite hard like I. Choose to use a uh, two of the hardest stones today to finish the uh, the edge, so um, it's a little bit more precise edge here. Finish the uh, the the what you call it the kiriha or the this um, this bevel with the uh, three thousand kensho K that's like pretty soft, so it makes the uh, the finish really nice here. this mm -hmm. and yeah if i will try to use them and see how they do you know if it chips because again this knife was returned from the customer with the weird type of chip happened yeah. Yeah. so uh, i will we'll test it out and see how well it holds and yeah. if we see no problem with it we you may see them at the next garage as the uh, retired demo section. Cool. Yeah. That's exci exciting. Awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we got a few more questions to answer, but before we do that, do you want to, uh, and James Wang says that's a beautiful finish, Nato. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, that's, James. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a, I'm, <laughs> I'm really impressed. That looks awesome. Yeah. All right. Do you wanna do you wanna maybe show off your uh, your secret project? Are you allowed to spill the beans on this one? Probably. I was gonna say it yesterday. The um, oh, perfect. Right. So we're, we're you know, we've been kind of talking to Masasan and well, several. Well, we have been thinking what the uh, world like. That was the theme of the yesterday's um, uh, thing. The yesterday's a uh, interview. What's the best night for? What's the you know. What you think the best knife for doing this stuff? Um, we, um, 
and we've always had this thought of, you know, what what's what's really best multi-purpose knife? What if you were to have one knife, what would that knife should be? Mm-hmm. And I've had this thoughts um, all the time, saying, you know, there are a lot of knives out there, but I feel like it's the it does one thing, but sometimes doesn't do the other really well. So right. I had this thought, you know, when you're actually cutting something, you use the tip really nice finesse. But I want to have the edge, the part of the edge to be able to do a little bit more tougher works. Right? Right. Yeah. Multi purpose. Multi purpose. They when I have when I have to cut the uh, bit of a not so much on filling, but the you know cutting into something a bit of hard, um, tiny bit of even like between the joints, cartridges on mm-hmm. some chickens. I want if I could actually use that the very last heel of one knife, but oh, yeah. be able to f- do super fine cuts on the um, onions or carrots, that yeah. is fantastic. So I mean, um, you could pretty much do not everything, but conceivably everything you'd want to do in the kitchen with that one knife. So I sketched out and found probably is the uh, best person to talk to, which obviously Masashi son. Obviously Masashi son. <laughs> no brainer. We're working. We haven't. This is not realization yet. It is in the talking stage. It has not. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. There's no samples or anything yet, but this is a knife that I'm hoping to see in next probably um, next probably a six month or four year. This is coming this is now to the blueprint. Yeah, so it's got the thickness, spine thickness. It's got the uh, the bevel thinness, and uh, each part. I have three part portion there as a uh, cross section. Yeah. Wow. And height and all that stuff. That's and crazy. I I had a, I had a some you know how about this steel and as I as we talk about this is something that we want to make sure that's like the ultimate and this is a functional art. It's not going to be at Damascus. Maybe we have some Damascus to kind right. of, you know cool stuff, but we're like. How about white? How about you know? Because we started from SLD Magic, because that's the, something that he was working on. But it was like, mm, how about this? Because in order to get the poten- like real um, the potential of the steel, it's like white carbon. Why not? Yeah, uh, Crochi. Well, I mean, that's, that's your number one steel. It yeah. was white number. Would it be white number one? Uh, one or two. Yeah. I mean, uh, we're looking for a, a functional um, functionality first. The ultimate yeah. uh, functional uh, knife, right? Yeah. So um, this is something that I would like to see in next. Um, yeah. Couple yeah, that's of- super, super cool. Yeah. You do know that, like, he's going to need to make, like, 50 of them because we'll have another Tinker Tank situation. No, 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 it's, no, no. it's going <laughs> to be. No, it's. No, I shouldn't. It's just really good, though, right? But yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's no, be- it's, it's super cool, though. I, I just from seeing this drawing, I want one really badly. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit of hybrid as well. Um, I, I actually drew, drew that the, the, the profile line to be a little no. bit more curvier than his original. Yeah. But it's, it's very thick at the spine at three, three point five mil. Yeah, that's a monster. Right? But he can forge it into this 1.5 at the tip. He, he can do that. That's so, crazy. Well, that's what you guys were talking about last night, like building that taper into the forging so yeah. you don't have to grind a lot of metal off. Yeah. That's, that's so cool. Cruelty. That's why Kurochi is good. Kurochi is the black finish. It's just the true representation of how it's forged, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, huh. yeah I, never, I never had that thought, but that's, that's really cool. Yeah. That's why we. That's why we. I suggested the um, 
uh, Kurochi, the black finish on for the all Sakai knives because I knew how uh, Tanaka san forges uh, his blade. So, mm -hmm. like, yeah, why don't why don't you guys just use that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Okay, well let's uh, let's get a few more questions and then uh, and then we'll be done for the day. Yeah. Um, Annabelle had a question here, but I'm not I'm not a hundred percent certain. Say you what? Uh, which which size of finer grit do you use on the edge? I think is that. I think that's the question. I'm a little little unclear, but Annabelle, if you're able to clarify it at all, at all we'd be happy to answer. Mm -hmm. What what size grit did you use to finish the edge on that knife? Uh, the uh, micro bevel, the uh, six thousand. Six thousand. Cool. I have to see how it cuts too. <laughs> I was just checking on my hair. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Tifal Goron has a good one. Says, "Hi, Nauto. Uh, how do you get a good finish on natural stones? I always face a patchy finish about a quarter of the tip of my knife. Any idea how to improve on my technique?" The uh, lot of lot of things. The uh, can be can cause that. The uh, really. First stone to seconds, like course to not only just if you're looking at the finishing, uh, it's really hard. You may have to go back to where you are working on a course and the second stone, which is I think really important. The get to something really hard, medium grit stone to see if that the bevel is nice and flat and see if there's any low spots or high spots and that kind of stuff. Make sure the bevel is really nice and even. Then start going up on the stones that the uh, that will uh, do. Uh, equal pressure is also important, and also if you uh, make sure you when you're sharpening it, uh, I do it and be dexterously so that the uh, uh, finish looks a little bit more even. But yeah. that the second the first stone to grind and make the basic shape and flatness out, and use the something hard stone to make sure that you've attained that the uh, shape, that's really important. Right. Okay, cool. Um, let me find the next one here. Um, Lorenzo's asking, this is something we talked about at the beginning of the episode, but we can go over it again. Any insight into which blacksmiths we could be getting an interview with in the future? Translation maybe. Uh -huh. Um, also, any info on if we may be getting that Bob Kramer video you guys have in the archives? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll try to dig up that Kramer video. Yeah, I'm sure Mason's good, just got it hidden on a hard drive or something. Yeah. Um, so coming up, the Mariyama sound from Osakai uh, now has changed to Huddle. I am finalizing it, but I will have recorded version of the uh, interview uh, with him because some of the blacksmiths uh, they're not comfortable doing it in live situation live stream so uh we'll do that everything in japanese and put the uh, english subtitles to it uh that's on mm. um, work works um again haven't decided there's definitely manaka san is uh on board uh Sweet. but that's i would awesome. like to have younger up-and-coming blacksmith especially from the uh, places like um remote areas where they're not surrounded by a bunch of blacksmith. Yeah, right. I have those guys on the one screen and do the um, you know questions and answers from me in Japanese so that they feel more comfortable. And mm. also those guys can have the can uh, build the connection, can build the bridges, especially yeah. those you know living super far from each other. Um, I like to do that. So right. That's an on works. Right. Uh, yeah. All right, cool. Um, so Annabelle clarified their question. Uh, I think they're talking about the uh, doing, yeah, one grit on one side, one grit on the other side. This is something we've talked about a lot, but talking about doing it like uh, Shibata san. And I, um, I, I, yeah. don't know if, I don't know if they uh, noticed, but that's what I did. 
Nice. That's awesome. I, I did a 1,000 on both sides and just did the 6,000 on one side and deeper at the other side. Cool. Yeah. Okay. This might be the last one for the day. Uh, this is James Wang here with his alternate account. <laughs> they keep using by accident. It says, by the way, Nato, I just saw this morning that Nigara came up with crazy white two plus blue two plus V2 cordless Damascus. Just mm. wondering what your thoughts are on that. I've seen it. Um, I have to see. The um, Nigara san does very crazy stuff. Um, I haven't touched it. <laughs> Um, I know it's it's uh, forged by the Nigara and uh, sharpened by Myojin, uh, Naohito Myojin uh, from the Tosa. I'm interested, but we may we may not bring them in. I do still like Shoichi Hashimoto's, as you you know you have one from Shoichi San. Mm -hmm. I like that that work a little bit slightly better yet. Although we are bringing a Damascus from Manaka soon. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. That's awesome. That's on that, that work. Yeah, we got some good stuff coming in in the next little while. Yeah. Uh, okay, this last one by the looks of it. Um, so Annabelle was just wondering, did you do a specific grid on a specific side? Oh, okay. It doesn't matter well, which side you do what grid. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I, I, I did 6,000 on uh, my first side, basically, with my right hand. Uh, the right side, yeah. Yeah, right side, because it feels more comfortable. Yeah. That's about, yeah. It doesn't it matter. Does, it doesn't side. matter. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone, All for right. tuning in. It's a fun show, as always. Um, we always appreciate the questions and uh, just the engagement in general and, and you guys showing up and everything. Um, if you haven't already, like the video, subscribe to the channel. We appreciate it, but it, it really does help us out a lot. Um, and if you haven't checked out Nauta's new video, he's got a great one on uh, flattening stones. Um, just just really important why you do it, uh, how to do it, and what what stones to do it with, what you know tools to use to flatten your stones. Um, other than that, got some great streams coming up next week. As I mentioned, in two weeks, Nauta's, uh, we're going to have Stump the Wizard. So you have to bring your toughest questions for Nauta. Uh, I guess they could probably be about Japanese food too, yeah. <laughs> but primarily... Hey. Challenging sharpening questions that are really technical, uh, and we're going to see uh, just how how deep we can get. So uh, that'll be in two weeks. But do your homework. Come come prepared with some good questions. Uh, if you haven't already, come join the Discord and hang out with us. Uh, yeah. It's a great place to chat with uh, with other viewers and some of our staff are on there, and just people that love knives and sharpening and food. Uh, you can post pictures. You can chat. All sorts of stuff. Uh, ask questions if you have questions. Um, yeah. Hey, you got anything else to talk about, Nato? No, that's all good. Thank awesome. you. Thanks, thanks for watching. Yeah, and, thanks, yeah, everyone. If you, if you haven't, uh, have, haven't seen the interview, it's all on that, the, our YouTube channel. Yes. So, you know. Yeah, we interviewed Masashi-san last night. Well, I say we. Nato <laughs> interviewed Masashi-san last night. It was super cool. Uh, really, really fantastic. You're Definitely behind the scenes. You, you, you did all the... Uh, I was only pushing buttons sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Have, Have a, a good